Have you ever been inspired by someone else's work or come across a business name that you thought was really catchy? Maybe you thought it would work for your business also. Or have you seen someone else's maybe blog posts or sales copy in an email and you thought, I'm just going to borrow this for a little bit. Hi, I'm Autumn Whit Boyd. I am an attorney and an expert in online business. And today's video and podcast episode is going to be the first in a series that I'm gonna do all through the month of June, talking about mistakes that you may be making in your business. So today's episode is going to focus on the mistake of copying other people. And there's a couple different ways that I see this show up. So I'm gonna go over three main ways that you may be copying people that could be damaging your business. So copying images, copying content, and copying someone else's name. So the name of a course, a website, a product, how does that show up? Uh, I'm gonna give my standard disclaimer. I am an attorney, I'm licensed to practice law in Tennessee, but nothing in this video or podcast episode should be taken as legal advice. If you have questions for your particular business, please make sure you speak with an attorney to get your questions answered. All right, so let's dive into the first issue that I see come up a lot. This often happens when people are newer in business, and I think a lot of people just don't know any better, um, but that is copying images that you don't have permission to use. Um, now, if you've been listening or following along for a while, you may know my background. Before I started my own law firm, I was a copyright attorney. I worked for the basically the premier copyright infringement law firm in the United States. It was called Harmon and Seidman. And I spent almost eight years going to courts all over the country representing photographers and stock photography agencies. So what we would do was we would um, help them enforce their copyrights. So they would have registered copyrights in their photographs. They would license them to other people. So they would give people permission to use them. And sometimes people would ignore the limits in those licenses. So maybe there'd be a license. They were allowed to print 100,000 copies of a book containing my client's image. And maybe they would print a million. I know that sounds crazy, but um, those are the kind of case lawsuits that I used to file. Um, or sometimes we would just find that people were using their images without any permission at all. Uh, and so we would file those lawsuits and there would often be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in damages from those lawsuits. Now those lawsuits involved a lot of images. Um, but I give that to you as background that um, I really do know my stuff <laughs> when it comes to using images without permission. So I want you to really listen. This is a very common mistake that I see business owners make. Again, often early in their business, usually once you, um, are in business for a while, you've either heard about this happening to someone else or you know seen it come up, most people realize at some point that you have to have permission to use an image. Um, but what I see happen a lot is, you know, you're, you're making your first website and you need some images. I did this myself when I was making my first website. I wanted some images of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I live. Um, and so it's very tempting to just do a Google image search and right click and save that image to your computer and then throw it up on your website. Now, if you do that, you do not have permission to use that image. You probably don't even know who it belongs to. Um, so you are basically a sitting duck for someone to send you a cease and desist letter or file a lawsuit against you for using their image without permission. That is copyright infringement. The way the law works in the United States, I'm a US attorney, so I can only speak for US laws, but uh, the person who creates an image owns the copyright in it from the very second, like the second you snap that picture with your camera or your phone uh, or a video camera, they own the copyright in that image. And just because you put it on the website where it can be found by Google, or if you put it on social media, that does not matter. The person who created the image owns that copyright. And so if you wanna use it, you have to ask for permission. It is required. Or you could be, like I said, a sitting duck for receiving a nasty cease and desist letter or even being sued. Um, now, what does that look like in practicality? I have helped a couple of clients deal with this. So let me play it out for you so you just can 
uh, get a preview. I'm hoping you never have to deal with this. Um, but it is, as I said, very common. Um, so I had a client a couple years ago who came to me. He had received a cease and desist letter from a law firm that was representing a photographer. And they had, my client was actually a copywriter. And so he had found these images and put them on his client's website. So it was kind of a double whammy. His clients were the ones who received the cease and desist letter, but it was really him that had, um, you know, done the, the finding of the image and the using it. So he wanted to make it right. So um, I looked at the letter from the law firm. And when we did a little digging, we did find that he had, you know, done the, the dreaded Google image search and just saved the image and used it without checking to see if it was free for use or if he needed to pay a license fee. Um, and when we dug into it, we found that he had found these images from a website that basically was meant to kind of entrap people. This was almost like, it's not a scam, like it is legit, but it was very sleazy the way it was set up. So this photographer had taken these images and had registered the copyright. So he had um, all the advantages of registering, which means he would get higher damages if he had to file a lawsuit, he could get his attorney's fees. There are all these advantages you get if you register with the Copyright Office. So he had done all of that the right way. And then he had put them on this website and he had optimized the SEO so that when someone was looking for a picture of, let's say, a flower to put on their website, his website would pop up first in the Google image searches. And it looked like it was free to use the image. He had even kind of, it was a little deceptive. If you read it carefully and you were a lawyer, maybe you would understand what it meant. But, you know, for an average Joe just looking for an image, it looked kind of like it was free to use. But there were some restrictions in very fine print about how you had to um, give this photographer credit and you had to follow these certain rules. But again, unless you were looking really carefully and if you're just pulling it up in a Google search, you would not have seen that. Um, you had to follow all those rules to be able to use the image. So my client had not done that. Um, I don't think he ever even went to the website. I think he just found it in the Google image search. So none of that stuff even came up. Um, but then what happened was the um, photographer had basically a computer or a robot <laughs> crawling the web looking for people who would use this image and checking to see had they purchased a license from him. No, my client had not. Um, and then also checking to see if they had followed the rules, the, those very fine print rules. So when they found out that he hadn't, they sent him a cease and desist letter. They threatened to sue him for, um, I think the maximum damages per image are $150,000. So that's you know, everything would have to go right for you to really get that amount in damages. But that was what he was claiming. And then demanding a settlement of, I can't remember how much, maybe $50,000 or $75,000. I mean, it was an insane amount of money for any small business owner to pay. Um, and so the way this played out was I came in and was able to thankfully negotiate that demand down. But it, I was not able to negotiate it to zero because the person on the other side had legitimate rights. And we researched and saw that they had filed lawsuits in the past. So they were kind of willing to put their money where their mouth was. So we knew it was a real threat. And um, my client ended up paying a settlement to resolve those claims. Um, again, it was not $50,000. It was a, a smaller number than that. But it did cost him some money. And of course, he had to hire me to handle it and help him. Um, so I say all of this because I want you to know this is what could happen to you if you are using images without permission. Now, hopefully you wouldn't fall prey to one of these scams, but I think this happens even with just people using social media posts. You know, you may see a beautiful image on a social media post and, um, you know, want to use it because it's perfect for what you need. The problem there is even if someone has posted on um, a social media platform, Instagram, Facebook, that doesn't mean that that image is free for anyone to use. Um, you could still get in trouble. So the best practice whenever you are using images is to, I'll give you a couple ideas. First, <laughs> take your own image. Second, if it's not your image, um, ask permission. And this can be really simple. Um, actually, I just I um, just took a screenshot. We'll put it in the show notes if we can. Um, because I was scrolling um, Instagram recently and I saw um, someone had posted a, like a beautiful image on their Instagram feed. Someone had commented below, oh, I love this photo. Do, photo. Do you mind if I repost it? And the person responded, sure, no problem. So it can be as simple as that. Asking permission can be as simple as that. Now you wanna save a screenshot 
If you send a DM or an email, again, just save it so that you have a record that you did get permission. But it doesn't have to be this like very fancy, long drawn out legal document. It could just be as simple as, hey, do you mind if I repost this? Or do you mind if I put this on my blog? Um, you know, just being clear of what you're gonna do with it. Um, but it can be very simple. And that way you know that no one is going to pop up later and accuse you of copyright infringement. Uh, the other option you have is to actually purchase a license. Um, so if there is an image that, um, like a very specific image you want of a statue or of a, um, a particular place, or you know you you want a particular um, you know flat lay maybe for for your website or your blog, there are tons and tons now. There are more all the time of stock photography agencies that have wonderful images that you can just pay a small fee you get a license, that just means permission, and you are off to the races. Now you can use it legitimately. Again, you wanna save that in your files so that if there are questions later, you can say, nope, I have, you know, I have the rights to use this. Um, and then there's no problems. You know that you have all the things that you need and um, you are in the clear. What I don't want you to do is that Google image search and just use an image that you don't know, you know where it came from or who it belongs to and what could possibly happen to you. All right, so that's images, that was the first thing. The second thing I see a lot is people copying content. And this often isn't, ver you know, with photos, it's usually what we call verbatim copying, where you're just copying and pasting. It's the exact same photo. It's not like you're recreating the photo. With copying content, what I see more here is um, you see a really great blog post and so you think, oh, well, I'm just gonna maybe tweak this a little bit or I'm gonna rewrite this first paragraph or I'm just gonna change this a little bit or, you know, same thing with like an Instagram caption or a, um, um, an email. Uh, what I see a lot is people who copy, but not exactly. And so this is a bit of a gray area in copyright law. But what I will tell you is the person who, you know, created that content, who wrote uh, that course module or that worksheet or that blog post, all of these things are protected by copyright in the United States. So as soon as that person, as soon as it was out of their brain and into a piece of paper or a, a website, you know, they do own the copyrights in that content. So they own the copyrights, they get to control how it is used. So even if you are tweaking it a little bit, making small changes, in the United States, that's called a derivative work in our, cop in our copyright law. Um, so that means you're basically making a new work out of someone else's work. Um, the problem is the person who created that original work, they own that right. They are the ones who get to decide who gets to make new works from their original works. So you are still infringing their copyright even if you're tweaking it, even if you're making some changes. Um, now there is something in the United States called fair use. I am not going to get too deep into that in this particular video because it is probably the most gray area in our intellectual property laws. And it's very risky to borrow someone else's content and think that you can tweak it just a little and rely on fair use. Um, I will tag other episodes in the show notes where I've talked about that more, but I would not recommend thinking that you can copy someone else's content, tweak it a little bit, and oh, I can just you know rely on fair use. Um, the reason for that is if you are relying on fair use, what that means is that you have been sued. It will not stop you from being sued. Someone will sue you for copyright infringement and you raise it as a defense. So I don't recommend that. It's very, very risky because it's, uh, like I said, it's a gray area. It's very much in the judgment of the judge or the jury or whoever is looking at your case to decide, is this really fair use or is this a copyright infringement? So I don't recommend that. Um, copying content is just never a good idea. And unlike with images, I don't recommend that you reach out to someone and ask, can I copy your content? They're almost always going to say no, unless it's something like a resource that they have, maybe it's a worksheet that they've put out and you say, hey, I think this would be really useful. Can I use this in my course? Or can I send this out to um, my students? You know, in that case, they may be willing to do it if you're willing to maybe scratch their back a little bit, maybe either pay them a license fee or, you know, promote one of their items or their products or services. Um, you know, there may be a mutually beneficial um, kind of a win-win way that you can use someone else's content, um, but you're gonna have to negotiate that. That's gonna be something where you wanna approach them, you wanna talk about it, you wanna figure out a way that you both feel like um, you're getting something out of it. Um, so copying content is just, it's kind of a rookie mistake, I have to say. I do see it, again, this is another thing I see often with newer business owners who 
aren't great at writing blog posts yet or aren't great at writing emails. And so you might see an email come into your inbox and you think, oh, this is really good. I bet they'll never know if I use it or if I just copy it and change it a little bit. But let me tell you, this is something that, you know, the online world where I work um, is very small. <laughs> and so um, it is very likely that maybe one of your customers is also on the other person's email list. And so if they see, they get two emails that look very similar back to back, that they may share your email with the person you copied from. I see this happen all the time. My clients will say, you know, one of my customers alerted me that someone's copying me. Um, and so you would just, you would maybe be amazed at how you, what you think is maybe under the radar is not. <laughs> so it is just never a good idea to copy someone else's content. Um, even though it's a gray area, if you are you know, editing it a little bit, tweaking it a little bit, um, it could come back to bite you. And it could really, even if you aren't ever sued, I, I don't see a lot of lawsuits with things like this because it's hard to prove a copyright claim if it's been changed a little bit. But I, what I will tell you is it will damage your reputation which is frankly, you know, what a lot of us build our businesses on if we have a personal brand, um, you know, it's our expertise and our way of doing things that people are really purchasing. Um, so damaging your reputation is not a great idea. Um, it will damage your reputation. Um, and it's, it's just kind of, it's kind of like cheating. It's not a great idea. Um, and so I, I highly, highly recommend that you create your own content, just like the images. My number one recommendation is always to create your own stuff. Uh, now, could you maybe get some help with this, maybe go through a course or use templates? Of course, but copying someone else's content is something that you should just absolutely avoid at all costs. The other uh, it, time that I see this happening, and this sometimes happens when people are further along in their business, is um, copying course content. So, you know, here at the AWB firm, we work with a lot of people who sell online courses. And uh, a lot of my clients who are million dollar course creators um, have seen issues with people coming through and taking their course and then basically copying the course. So they're creating a new course, the student is, but they're following the same outline. They are you know, going through the same steps or they're teaching the same process. Again, that's a very gray area when it comes to like the letter of the copyright law, but it is not a good idea. It is not going to help you be successful. Copying someone else's stuff is just, um, like I said, it's kind of cheating. And um, if you are not coming up with things on your own through your own experience, through working with people and figuring things out on your own, it's never gonna be as good as the thing that you're copying. Um, and you could also probably ruin some relationships, get a nasty cease and desist letter, um, hurt your reputation, and then there's karma. So karma might come back to get you. So we just, my number one recommendation when it comes to copying content is just don't do it. Come up with your own stuff, unless you can figure out a way to talk with the other person and create a win-win where you can share their content and they're getting something back from it. All right, the third thing that I wanna talk about is copying names. So, so far the first two things we've been talking about have been copyright. Now we're gonna move into trademark territory. So in the United States, trademarks protect things that identify the source of a product or service. So really, trademark law is meant to protect customers, not companies. It's meant so that if I go to the grocery store and I want a can of Coke, I know what that tastes like, I know what I want. I don't accidentally grab a, pe a can of Pepsi that tastes totally different. So it's gonna protect things like your product name, your company name, your logos, anything that identifies where the product come from, comes from so that you know, basically you know what you're getting when you purchase something. Now in the online world, what that typically means, it's gonna be course names, product names, company names, it could be your website URL or your website name, domain name, um, or if you have um, you know, any digital products, eBooks, things like that. It's typically gonna be names. Sometimes it'll involve taglines too, but um, in the online space, what I typically see with trademark issues is it's names of things, maybe the name of a Facebook group or the name of a group program or a membership site. Things like this, is things like that is what we think about when we think about trademarks. Um, so again, you may have seen someone else who has a really catchy name and you think, oh, I could maybe use that name for something in my business. Um, this is another one where I just would, cannot recommend enough that you come up with your own unique name. Um, copying someone else's name for your course, for your website, for your products is just never a good idea. Because if it's similar to someone else's name, you're going to be infringing their trademark rights. There's really no way to make it a win-win. 
because you're gonna be confusing customers. And my guess is that may be what you're intending. So maybe you're hoping someone is searching for, so like, let's use the example of Marie Forleo's B-School. Um, if you um, have a similar name, maybe it's not exactly that. Maybe it's, um, you know, B-School Light or B-School for uh, photographers. I've been talking about photographers. Um, you know, that is still, my guess is you're probably hoping to kind of ride on her coattails and get some of her SEO, get some of her website traffic when people are searching for that. Um, so that is not going to be okay. That is going to confuse customers. They're going to land on that site thinking they're getting something from Marie and they're going to be getting something from you. And that is not what they wanted. So that is trademark infringement. It is not okay. I want you to, whenever you're thinking about a new name or um, a new product, a new website, I want you to do a trademark search. And we will drop in the comments um, another episode I have about how to do a trademark search on your own so you can make sure that you are not infringing anyone else's rights. Um, but again, this is just an area where I want you to steer really clear. Um, you're always gonna be safest if you come up with something new, something that is really unique to you. Uh, because again, it's like cheating. You don't wanna be riding someone else's coattails. You wanna be building your own brand that's not gonna be confused with someone else's. Because what if your course is better than Marie's? What if your course is, becomes more popular? You don't want people getting your thing confused with hers. Um, you know, let's look at the bright side. You want to be building something that you can really own, that you can place your own stamp on, that you could um, hypothetically register with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office if it becomes successful and you decide you want to you know, plant your flag in the ground and protect it. Marie has already registered B-School. I know because I looked. Um, so if you tried to register you know, B-School for photographers, you're not going to be allowed to do it because the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is going to reject that. They're going to say that is way too similar to Marie's already registered trademark for the same types of services. So we're not going to allow that. So when it comes to copying someone else's name, um, I recommend that my clients who have big businesses with popular courses and maybe they've registered their own trademarks, that they actually, what we call, we call it policing their trademark rights. So I, I recommend that they set up a Google alert. For some of the clients, we actually monitor their trademarks. So we search the US Patent and Trademark Office database to, to try and catch anybody who's trying to register a similar trademark. Um, because as a trademark owner, you actually have the duty to do that. You are required to do that to maintain your trademark rights. Because of course, it would be super confusing if there were 10 different B-schools out there. Who knows which one is the real one? Um, so you have the responsibility as a trademark owner to tell other people they can't use your same trademark. Um, so if you are copying someone else's trademark for a course name, a website name, a product name, um, you are very likely to be on the receiving end of a mean cease and desist letter or even a nice one. Even a nice one is not great. Um, but this is another kind of rookie mistake that I see sometimes. Um, I actually have a client with a very popular podcast, millions and millions of downloads, um, who uh, just noticed that someone had started a new podcast with the exact same name. Uh, and it was actually, it was a student group, so we felt a little badly about sending them a cease and desist letter. But at the end of the day, my client has the responsibility to protect their trademark rights. Um, and the, the other person, the students responded, they said, oh, well, we think ours is different because they had added a couple more words after my client's podcast name. Uh, but it was going to be very confusing. You know, when you search in iTunes for this podcast name, you don't want to come up, you don't want to have 12 other ones come up and you don't know which one is the right one. So it's really important to avoid these common mistakes. So I think as I wrap up, the most important thing is to make sure that you're creating your own content, your own, you know, creating your own names for things. That is always the safest bet. Um, and then if you do find someone else's content that you think would be really helpful to your audience or your students, um, you know, reaching out, contacting the person and asking for permission is always the next best bet. All right, I hope this has been helpful. We This is episode 141, and so the show notes for this episode are gonna be on the website at awbfirm.com slash podcast 141. And we'll also have a free resource there for you. We have a guide to using other people's stuff legally. So if you were um, you know, on a walk or doing the dishes, that's what I do when I'm listening to podcasts. While you were listening to this, head on over to the show notes page and you can get our, I call it copyright 201. So this is a guide to using other people's stuff legally. If you didn't take notes with this episode, don't worry. It's all in that guide. So head on over and get it for free today. 
Um, I'm going live every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you if you tuned in live on Facebook. Join me next week. And if you have any questions relevant to the topic, you can ask them to me then. And um, as I mentioned, all through June, we're going to have a series about business mistakes. Next week, I have an interview with Lisa Princick. We talked about the mistake of not having a good business model for your business, of just kind of operating willy-nilly. Um, and then upcoming later this month, we will also be talking about um, not protecting your business from if you were sued. So we'll be talking about how to protect yourself from that. And also um, the mistake of hiring independent contractors the wrong way. So I see this a lot. So I'm excited to talk about that. All right. I hope you guys have a wonderful week and I will talk to you next time.